Thank you very much. I think we all recognize that 2022 was a very exciting year for long read sequencing technology and for reference genomes. And I think that's why I'm on stage right now is because I get to celebrate with you the first release of a human genome. And that's really celebrating this amazing group of humans at the bottom. This is the Telomere to Telomere Consortium of which I get to present on behalf of today. And we're really illustrating kind of our work using the science um, article that I'm showing you here. And what your eyes are seeing with those red bars are all the parts of the genome that had been closed. That represents about 200 million bases that were missing from our previous reference assemblies. And I think this is also a moment that we need to take a step back and actually applaud and recognize that the reason that we got to this point is because we had a real step change in sequencing technology in long reads. This was a celebration of a combination of both high accuracy with HiFi, as well as having access to ultra-long sequence data. And this created a new standard with the way that we do science. This enables new science. This allows researchers for the first time to go into regions we thought were intractable and ask real biological questions about segmental duplications, gene families, and centromeres that we know are fundamentally important for biology. Now, it's not just putting these long reads to make an assembly. Long reads have a longer story here. We're trying to understand how to use long reads, as I'm showing here for the acrocentric short arms, to study gene patterns, expression, methylation. The biology is inherent not only in the assembly itself, but by taking the long reads, mapping it to the assembly, and learning more about genome biology. What we're learning is that quality matters. Having a more accurate um, reference, if it's even mapping 1,000 genomes data to show the improvements, or genotyping copy number variants, as I'm showing here for a segmental duplication paper that was led by Mitchell Volger, consistently what we're finding is a more complete and a more accurate reference leads to more information in terms of variant calling. Having complete gene catalogs matters. What I'm showing you here is a com an assessment of the new genes in red that we now can see because we have access to a complete genome. And this is important because when you actually have a complete catalog of genes, as I'm trying to show you here for HG38 versus CHM13, it improves your mapping. That color bar really illustrates in HG38 that you're mismapping parallax of that site because there's only nine copies in HG38 versus 23 copies which we know exist in CHM13. And this is representing about 8 million bases, where I'm trying to show you on the bottom, that represent false gene copies and missing gene copies that are due to errors in the assembly because it's not complete. Now, many of us in the audience already know that short read data is incomplete for helping us understanding the epigenome. What I'm trying to show on the top is when you look at bisulfite sequencing, you get this kind of patchy representation. However, with long reads, with DNA modification calls, we can study the genome end to end. That means by spanning the genome, we can study biology end to end. And this is important when you start thinking about the duplicated genes I'm showing on my slide as well. And when you start thinking about unique genes, things that we've looked at for decades that are shown in black, we can now treat all of the segmentally duplicated genes that are in red the same. In other words, the paralogs can be studied if they're expressed, we can study their biology, and we can study their epigenetic regulation for the first time. This is what it means to be comprehensive. And it's not just genes. I think many of you in the audience may know that my heart is in satellite DNA. And this is the first time we not only get to see the tandem repeats that span every single centromere in the human genome, but also get to look at the epigenetic signature. We see a diagnostic dip where that maps to regions that are defining the genomic sites of centromere formation. And by taking this a step further, looking at genetics and epigenetics, we can begin to look at the variation not only at the genetic level, but at the epigenetic level as well. And this gives me an opportunity to really highlight that a student of mine, Dan Zhu, is giving a, a, a talk uh, tomorrow, so make sure to attend his lightning and poster session. And probably the hardest chromosome at all, uh, that's the chromosome Y, where we know it's riddled with repeats, inversions, and the YQ was missing for decades. This is really a, a testament to how far we've come into the T to T era, that we are celebrating its release to the public. And this is crediting, once again, the leadership of Rangri. So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, we're celebrating that the T to T genome is finally complete. But what I want to emphasize even more is everyone in the audience should know we can do this. 
So now we're going to start to routinely do this. This will soon become the new standard. The train has left the station. And it's not only for human, we're seeing references from non-human primates, as well as plant species, come up to reach this type of new T to T standard. However, reaching one T to T genome is simply not enough. We know that we need to create new technology in order to do this more routinely and not involve so much manual curation, as well as take this to the production of hundreds, if not thousands, of T to T genomes, so that everyone in this audience could have their own T to T genome. So this is where I get to switch hats and put on my hat for the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium in front of you. We're here, the T to T Consortium has paired up to try to create a, a more global reference of the human reference genome. So far, we've been talking about completions of human genomes kind of as end-to-end -end references, but I want you to think about another dimension, and that is where we actually need to capture sequence variation across the globe. And so the goal of the human pan genome is to improve the representation of global genomic diversity by sequencing T to T, that high, that high quality, of at least 350 diverse deployed references. Now, to do that, it means that we need to work with individuals who are properly consented for open data sharing. We're working initially with a 1,000 Genomes Project. Here, I'm kind of giving you a breakdown of the first release of 94 haplotypes that were part of our Pan Genome Project. I also wanted to credit in this slide that this is a really big effort. This is big science at its best. This is a multi-center, multi-platform approach, where we have a number of centers that are generating PAC bio hi fi We have a number. We at UC Santa Cruz, we are the production center for Nanopore, and we're also using OmniC from Cantana Bio. And in doing so, we're seeing consistency. We're consistency in quality of the length and consistency of the quality at the base pair level. But where we are not is at automated T to T, which is where we need to be. Now, there's been a lot of enthusiasm lately for the release of Verco, which is our new assembly method that has been developed and pioneered out of Adam Philippi's group. And here, what we're doing is kind of automating that T to T protocol that we did for CHM13, where you take the first long, accurate reads and you're building this kind of unitic string graph. You're then bringing in the ultra long reads to allow a broader resolution or creating a threading through to create this type of broader string graph. And then after that, you can either phase with high C or trio based information. Now, in doing this, right out the gate, we're looking at 25 out of 46 diploid diploid chromosomes that are coming out T to T. All right, so in this case, we're looking at the gaps in, without these chromosomes as well as 99.9997%, as you can see on the slide. However, there's a couple of points that I really want to make while we're celebrating this new HG002 T to T diploid reference that Adam Philippi recently um, announced on Twitter. And that is that to get from that 25 to a T to T, it took an extensive amount of expert curation once again. And although we're aiming to take this to Q100, and it's going to be a really impactful resource, to get there, we had to throw the kitchen sink again. We're talking about 170x Hi-Fi, 170x ONT, ultra-long, and once again, these are trio-phased. So we're close enough to Christmas where I can start to share with you my wish list. And so if you can give me a moment, I think that all of us can recognize there's a huge advantage here if we could take that Q30 and just evaluate what it means to have a longer read length. And so if we can have longer, high accuracy Q30 reads, that would be a dream. I would love for us to test that and see how far we can get to automated T to T. Also, I, I'm an assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz. I have a Promethean in my lab. I would love for my team to be able to generate a T to T genome with one machine under one roof. And this, I'm sure, will benefit other labs, not only the MEGA lab around the world. And ultimately, in order for this to be everyone in the audience gets their T to T genome, we have to talk about how to reduce the cost. And as someone who's running a lot of the production budget, that's also important to me too for the HPRC project. Now, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the duplex data. I wanted to go ahead and start off that I share that enthusiasm. This is where you're actually reading in the template and complement reads and taking a highly accurate product, which is around expected to be high, high cues. Um, and here, what I'm showing you is that we were given access, and I'm very grateful for this, um, for the high tuplex flow cells um, that we're able to run in our group. I also want to acknowledge that we're using something called a stereo method. Now, Catherine Lawrence will go over this later today, but essentially what you're doing is you're getting both speed 
and accuracy by reading the template and complement simultaneously. And this gives you really robust results. So we did this. We accepted these flow cells and we ran them in our lab. And these are real data from the MEGA lab, where we're seeing a duplex median Q score of 30.1, which is pretty mind boggling. And I, for me, I kind of took a step back because the peak you're seeing is at the front is, is perfect. And that's pretty amazing, too. We are still seeing a lot of variability. Here I'm showing you that across 12 flow cells that we ran within my group, we're getting about 30x coverage of data, but about 30% of that is duplex. Now, we do shear um, to about 50 KB for this protocol, so I was actually amazed that we still have a tail that extends past 100 kilobases when we look at duplex data only. And our longest read, at least for our data set, was at 135 kilobases that I'm showing you here. And the neat thing, too, is that you're not only getting duplex with these runs, you're getting simplex, too. So our team has been really interested in kind of how we can incorporate the simplex data, because as you can see from this slide, you really have a nice addition of long read data sets to pull into your assembly and your analysis efforts. So yeah, I, I, we're I'm eager to go back to Santa Cruz, actually, because I've gotten the first wish, and it's not even Christmas yet, and the idea that we do have these longer, high accuracy Q30 reads that we can now begin to turn the crank and see where we can go in terms of getting automated T to T chromosomes. Now, what about one machine under one roof? I mentioned before with the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium or the HPRC, this is a big multi-center production. Many labs are involved. And I'm trying to illustrate as well, not only the coverages, but the length of the reads that we have as kind of our standard production protocol. And what I would like is to be able to do T2T projects in my own lab. And in doing so, what I would love to test is, what if we had duplex? What if we had ultralong? And what if we had PORC? These are the three data platforms that perhaps we could replace with the ONT method, I mean, and then see if we can get to these T2T status as well. We've gone through and generated PORC in my lab as well, so we're going to check to see its performance relative to high C. This is illustrating a, a new tool called GFACE, which was developed by Ryan at the US um, and Benedict Patents Group. And essentially what this is, is a module way for us to take high C data and begin to phase um, graphs. It's very easy to use. Um, it can work for most of these uh, methods, which actually use high C or poor C. And in doing this type of comparison, what we're seeing is an improvement in switch error that's observed with only one library of poor C. So we're working on that. Right now we're optimizing how can we take one machine under one roof and where can we move next in order to take this to T to T. And then finally, I kind of want to end my talk with emphasizing that all of this really makes sense when we can reduce the cost. At the end of the day, it, is, it does weigh in the economy of, of doing these types of sequencing projects. Is there a path forward where we can consider thinking about a P2 solo solution? Where all of a sudden a lab, I don't know if it's the MEGA lab or a lab around the world, could have this type of protocol in mind, where they're aiming for their own T2T genome, and they have a combination of expected data types and an algorithm to go through and finish. Now, I do think that having this type of <clears throat> information is critical, because not only will it help us look comprehensively across all of the variants to be able to find variants that are important to associate with disease, I think it will help us understand not only differences that exist within our human histories and human humanity and the population, but also looking comparatively across different species. And I think there are a lot of unknown biology that we're just being able to scratch the surface on that requires kind of a new look with long read functional assays to be able to really say something constructive and important. So with that, I want to have an acknowledgement of on the top row is our Nanopore production team, members of our, H, our UC Santa Cruz group that helped with the data analysis. On the bottom, I want you to recognize the T2T consortium once again, who are amazing humans who um, really stepped up to the challenge of completing a human genome. And I think a lot of the material that I shared with you today was really cutting edge. Um, we are incredibly grateful to have access to these duplex flow cells or high duplex flow cells, as well as all of the new duplex calling software and, and access to the partnership with ONT. So thank you very much. <laughs>